after Letter to Gord is called Letter in which I ask you about playing Massey Hall and stuff. And it's kind of the beginning of the Gord section. Um, yeah, I'll just start. Hey Gord, this is the beginning of the letter. I'm not going to begin where normal biographies begin because, I don't know, all those books that go on to describe the legend playing with his toys and burning his hand on the stove top and how his grade three teacher threw a ruler at him and the time he wet his pants coming home from school and what his dog's name was and how we saw his uncle die in a horrible chipper accident and what he did when he got his first report card. I don't know. Me, I always want to know what the... I want, always want the writer to get why... Sorry. Me, I always want the writer to get to the reasons why anyone would write a book about that first person in the first place, which in your case is the music, the songs, guitar playing, words, concerts, radio, Canada, Mariposa, drugs and love and booze, and other stuff. So I think we should start with me imagining you being a kid like any other preteen kid, sitting on the quilt at the edge of your bed, dressed in ill-fitting brown cords that your mom bought for you at the buy right, playing a guitar that came out of a long cardboard box, trying to find great sweeping chords to match the fullness of the infinite sky, even though the sound that you made hurt your hands and the tips of your fingers were sore, but screw it. Your grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents before them had dug their mitts deep into the hard, rich soil to build a life for their sons and daughters. And because they did, you sat there and you kept on playing. An A chord struck with the E string accidentally opened that released a long, wide note at the bottom of the neck which made you think of a turn swallowed by the water's horizon as your mom tapped on the door and told you, phone call, son, it's Whalen. I know your friend's name was Whalen because it was written in that other book about you, the one by Maynard Collins called If You Could Read His Mind, which he published 30 years ago. You spoke to Whalen, then returned to your room where you leaned your guitar on the cowboy wallpapered wall and slipped on your boots and walked over to your friend's house where you played board games with him at the kitchen table. Whalen said that he liked that new song by that by that skinny guy with the goatee, Buddy Knox, but you weren't sure. No gulls, no lakes, no silence. You were 12, I think. Life was moving forward, though, damned if you knew where. You like to sing and you like to run. I did, too. Don't all 12-year-olds? Well, maybe not Glenn Gould, but still. <laughs> you went to junior choir practice at St. Paul's United Church in Orillia. I imagine the old pastor dressed in dark robes, taking you aside and telling you that you sang like an angel and just hearing him say that word, angel, gave you a funny feeling. A soft word coming from such a severe man. A word he let pass through his lips and over his teeth because your voice had somehow found a place between his ribcage and heart. And maybe it was then that you understood how music worked and why it had lasted forever despite the changing world and dinosaurs and history and war and loving God. I read somewhere that you sang high, way high, filling neighborhood churches as the congregation swooned to the sound of your voice twirling about the molding at the top of the church columns the way Aretha Franklin's or Little Richard's or Sam Cook's did, although I didn't know the names of those people, not yet. Besides, their voices had been boiled in the dirty heat of the American South, while yours had been born in the seizing cold. Something you didn't know either, not yet, and maybe you're realizing this for the first time here, but maybe not, because I have no idea whether you're reading this. During church service, you could see your mom and dad sitting in the pews. Mom looking proud, and dad, well, Dad just being dad as all dads are. As you raised your chin with your hands hanging like scarves at your sides, and you felt your diaphragm fill, then empty, then fill again, the way your uncle worked the bellow, raising fire from the heart. At West Ward Public School, they played a recording of you singing an Irish lullaby over the public address system to your friends and, and classmates and teachers during Parents' Day. Pretty much the whole town standing there listening as your soprano rang through the speaker grills at the front of those dry yellow classrooms. If your school was anything like mine, or my kids come to think of it, your principal was named either King or Jenkins or Arnold. They were all English back then, the principals. And what you couldn't see was how his comportment softened as he spared a moment to listen to the tune you'd learned from the prize Weaver's record that you played three times a day and once at bedtime on your family's foreign one. And then years later, you were in Masson Hall. I played there too. Just saying the name makes me shiver. And I wonder if it still makes you shiver, having played it so many times over the years. It was the first time you sang in the big city, wasn't it? Shooter Street, Allen Gardens, the subway, Simpsons, Franz, Le Coq d'Or, City Hall. You were just down the block from Maple Leaf Gardens where Teeter Kennedy played and where the woman used to clang her bell and yell whenever he cut the puck on the stick and charged up the ice. I know this meant something to you, Gord, because in 1993 they made you a celebrity captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs, and I also know that you used to go to the games all the time in the 70s and 80s, 
because Bill's mom saw you there, just hanging out, no big deal, signing autographs and talking to Trey. Kathy Evelyn Smith also wrote that hockey games at Maple Leaf Gardens became part of the ritual. Hoarse from cheering, we'd trudge home to the apartment through the snow. Don't know if you know it, Gord, but I love the Leafs too. Love. I get flack for it. Who doesn't? Especially when I'm on the road playing gigs or doing book tours. But I wonder whether anyone makes fun when you're around being a legend and everything. Once this guy came up to me after a show and was all gushing about our songs and our albums and our concerts, and then before he left he said, shame you're a Leafs fan, no. <laughs> I think he was a Habs fan, but I'm not sure if fucking Habs. Do you hate them as much as I hate them? Boy? If you're a real Leafs fan, which again, according to Bill's mom, you are, then you probably hate him too. Oh yeah, even if you don't want to talk to me about music or your life board, I'd be happy to sit around and bash the Habs. That way we could avoid talking about anything real, even though talking about hockey is realer than most things appear to me. So Gord, there you were in Massey Hall. You smelled the hall's wood, took in the warmth of the oak balustrades, the cushioned seats. You noticed the light of the falling day refracted through the stained glass windows in the upper balcony, and, what, and at once the place felt more like home than it had any right to be. Something so small, yet so big. So many people so far away, yet so close. Hours later, after everyone had arrived wearing fine Eaton suits and dresses bought after a pause to consider the appropriate nature of such an extravagant purchase, you walked on stage, rooted yourself at the center of the choir, and you sang, your voice finding the height of the theater's round ceiling and staying there, harmonies borne one over the other and floating hands chained above the crowd. It was a competition and you won, first place in the boys' open category for unchanged voices at the Kiwanis Music Festival. After it was done, you were back in the car with your mom and dad and older sister Beverly, and it was late evening, and you thought that maybe something had changed, but maybe something hadn't. Your dad worked the steering wheel and fiddled with the radio, and then he looked at you in the rearview mirror before saying, Good work tonight, son. Or maybe he didn't tell you anything. Being a man of few words. That's what they say about your dad. Silent, authoritarian, as complicated as any man who walked the earth. He used to hit you with a hairbrush, or was it a belt or a strap? I've read stories where each of these are described. I also know that one night you took the brush or belt or strap and buried it in the backyard in an act of resolute defiance that would shadow pretty much everything you did in your life, good and bad. Maynard Collins said that your dad used to work in a bank and that it was a good job, but that when the bosses found out that he was engaged to your mom, they fired him. Apparently they wanted single men in their employ, which seems stupid, but those were different times. He got a job at Wags Laundry, a job he didn't like much, but really, who likes their job? And that's where he stayed until he retired. I don't know if he was proud of you, but like I said, parents have a funny way of expressing themselves. Still, during that car ride home, maybe it was what he didn't say that mattered most. Maybe by saying nothing, he was saying this. All kids are angels, son. And your wings are steady, sure. Just because you can sing doesn't mean you can fly. Not yet. Still, the old man stopped at the Severn Hotel. You ordered frog's legs and toasted winning with ginger ale. The bubbles popped hot against your throat. Sometimes parents say the weirdest things. Sometimes what's weirdest is what they don't say at all. All right.